In this video, we'll go into detail about the truth underlying ketosis and refute many common statements backed by misleading science, incorrect biochemistry, and a fundamental lack of understanding of human biology. Yeah, no, this is just not true. I, 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 want, I want the data for that. What are the top seven misleading statements that keto diet gurus say, and why are they wrong? I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and today's video was sent to me on low-carb keto diet debunking seven misleading statements from plant-based news. Now, of course, there is some plant-based bias in the name of plant-based news, but I think it's important to understand the logic or illogic that often is used to try to persuade you to eat a plant-based diet. I mean, I, I believe now that that's their agenda, not that they know much about other approaches, but uh, a lot of people will consider them a, a reasonable source of information that they don't know much about, like the keto diet. So let's see how this video goes. Let's face it, the ketogenic diet is arguably the most popular dietary trend in our world today, especially for those living with diabetes. It's likely that you've been tempted to follow a ketogenic diet to lose weight, drop your A1C, and flatline your blood glucose. Even though it may seem tempting to enter the metabolic state of ketosis, it's important to understand the caveats of ketosis so that you fully understand your risks for developing long-term complications. What exactly is ketosis? And why is ketosis a popular recommendation for those living with diabetes? A ketogenic diet is a very low carbohydrate diet by design, containing a maximum of 30 grams of dietary carbohydrate per day. At the base of the ketogenic food pyramid are eggs, dairy, meat, oil, and fish, which make up the bulk of calories eaten. Non-starchy vegetables contain too much carbohydrate energy and are avoided while non-starchy vegetables or green vegetables are included along with nuts, seeds, and a very limited amount of fruit mainly berries. Now the ketogenic diet explicitly prohibits the consumption of grain products, even whole grains, as well as pasta, refined sugar, milk, corn, legumes, including lentils, beans, and peas, as well as rice. When you eat a ketogenic diet, your muscles and liver switch from oxidizing glucose as their primary fuel to fatty acids as their primary fuel. And in order to withstand a very low carbohydrate intake, your liver manufactures ketone bodies as an emergency backup fuel for your brain when in the state of ketosis. A lot of this information is true. The diabetes is reversed, uh, blood sugar, although I don't like the term flatline <laughs> that with a clinical doctor background or if you ever watch an ER show, flatline means if it's the heart, it means your heart's not beating anymore. So they could have used a different, how about a stable blood sugar would be a more positive way to, to say it. Uh, and then, yeah, all these, these great things can happen uh, and that the pyramid or now let's say you call it a triangle so you don't get remembering that whole pyramid thing. Um, but those, those things seem fine. Now, I'm starting to get into the, the language here. I think it's really important that, so after two days of not eating, everyone goes into nutritional ketosis. Every human, every mammal for that matter. You store fat on your body. When you're needing energy, you draw upon your fat stores. So everyone goes into nutritional ketosis if you don't eat for two days. Now, everyone goes into nutritional ketosis if you don't eat carbs for two or three days because the proteins and fats that you eat don't interfere with the fat burning. So that's what nutritional ketosis is. It, and uh, it's not a, I don't know that it's an emergency backup system. I mean, you, you could, uh, turning things upside down, say we're supposed to be in nutritional ketosis. And when we're not, we manufacture glucose, the liver manufactures glucose as an emergency supply and for some organs, like the heart, the heart muscle itself runs on fat, fatty acids. So you want those fatty acids. So, you know, if you flip things upside down, uh, the language isn't so clear that it's an emergency supply. The, the, uh, you watch one of these reality shows where people don't eat for two days or 21 days, their brain's functioning. Now, they're 
not happy being out in the middle of nowhere, but they're they're able to find food and and water and shelter, and so and they're in nutritional ketosis. Uh, so some people even think they have better mental clarity when they're in nutritional ketosis. They don't have that carb brain fog. You know, let me know your uh, response uh, in the comments below. But is it really an emergency backup supply that would make? Um, well, let's see how he explains it. If you're living with diabetes, this may sound like a great idea because your pancreas is provided with an opportunity to reduce insulin production due to low carbohydrate intake. Now, millions of people around the world who eat a ketogenic diet achieve a flatline blood glucose profile and greatly reduce or eliminate their need for oral medication and insulin. If you've experienced this yourself, you may be thinking, great, I solved the problem. Eating a ketogenic diet is keeping my blood glucose in control and therefore my diabetes health is going up. In addition, the state of ketosis induces a number of short-term benefits, including rapid weight loss, reduced fasting glucose, reduced post-meal blood glucose, reduced A1C, reduced total cholesterol, reduced LDL cholesterol, and flatline blood glucose. The problem is that eating a ketogenic diet significantly increases your risk for chronic disease and premature death in the long term. After researching the advice from the top ketosis gurus, we made a list of the seven biggest and most dangerous misconceptions. So I, I can see, uh, and this is kind of classic, blending in the nutritional epidemiology science. Um, even uh, you could define a low carb or keto diet as keto-like and get it published in, in the American Cardi of College of Cardiology press release, keto-like. You don't have to be very precise about what we're talking about because everyone knows it's bad. No, so so uh, uh, I see what, what he's trying to do is argue, well, you might feel good now, but just wait until you go around that corner. You wait 20 years and you're going to be Ill. You can assess your health from now to that 20 years or however long it is. In fact, I have people come to me every few months or every six months during the process to make sure everything's fine. And those who choose to do a low carb or keto lifestyle for a long period of time, I recommend they get every measurement of health that they can. So, so it's not like you're near a cliff. I hate the term danger because that makes me feel like I'm at the edge of a cliff. I'm going to fall off. No, you can actually measure things along the way. Things don't happen overnight. And, um, but the, I said, well, your short-term benefits, and you might be feeling great, which is great. And then I knew there was going to be a but. Just wait, you know. Um, and and that's really too bad because most people who come to me and they've done every kind of weight loss program, they have a lot of weight to lose. They're waiting for the shoe to drop to make it not work. I have people who come to me and they've lost 200 pounds on a low carb keto diet, and they still have the mentality that I, I think one day this isn't going to work. And so that this kind of mental ploy feeds into that, oh, I, one day it's not going to work. No, it will work. You can trust your experience and trust the experience of others that were down the road from you. And you can actually measure all of the things that you would typically measure to not just put yourself in a, you know, like an ostrich in the, put the head in the sand and then 20 years go by and suddenly you're in this long-term epidemiology study with mortality and all. It's apples and oranges here, you know, comparing things that really don't Ketosis well. misconception number about one. ketogenic Insulin diets. is your fat storage hormone. Now, you may have heard people in the ketogenic community refer to insulin as your fat storage hormone, and that by adopting a very low carbohydrate diet, you prevent your blood glucose from spiking after a meal. Now, hold on a second. Open any biology textbook, and you'll find that the primary function of insulin is to help glucose exit your blood and enter tissues. But that insulin also helps fatty acids and amino acids enter your blood and enter tissues. It is absolutely critical to understand that the primary function of insulin is to help transport glucose out of your blood and into tissues. And a secondary effect of insulin is to help transport fatty acids and amino acids out of your blood and into tissues. Simply because insulin has the ability to transport fat into tissues does not mean that it's factually correct to label insulin as your fat storage hormone. Time out. I've watched this clip a few times. When the fatty acids are, by insulin, taken into the fat cell, that's called 
a fat storage hormone. <laughs> and so the logic, again, I've watched this a few times, is, well, it's a fat storage hormone, but it's also the glucose storing hormone. So therefore, it's not the fat storage hormone. No, that's not logic. That, that, and the term, I found that this, this fellow uh, uses the term technically and, and all that. No, it is a fat storage hormone, <laughs> even if it is a glucose storing hormone. And he never used the term fat storage when he said fatty acids going into the cells, including the fat cells, so that you, if you didn't, it's like me going to the mechanic. I don't really understand the language, but if, if you code it in a, a to a certain way. So if you never say fat storage, you're going to think what he's talking about means insulin doesn't cause fat storage when he just said it in different language. And I have to think that this was done to be misleading because it is the fat storage hormone. If you take a child who is type one diabetic, has no insulin around, they are unable to store fat. They're emaciated. And once you give them insulin, they plump up with fat storage because insulin is required for fat storage. So uh, th this is not boding well if this is the number one false statement because this is true. A and I remember looking back uh, at this doctor's uh, background. He's not a clinical researcher. Um, I think he's a, a epidemiology or a PhD researcher that really isn't uh, aware of the clinical observation that when you once you put people on insulin they make them uh, start shooting insulin for type 2 diabetes most people will gain weight i mean it's it's almost a certainty and and, and that's another reason why clinical doctors understand the risk of being put on insulin is that you'll gain weight and if gaining weight is one of the issues that relates to the diabetes once you get put on insulin you're going to always have diabetes if you always continue to gain weight so yes, the insulin helps the fatty acids into the fat cells, and that's called fat storage. This is a gross exaggeration of the actual role of insulin and is meant to scare people into believing that any amount of insulin in circulation will make you fat. Now, ins now it's, it's interesting how the, the twisting uh, of, we're not talking about none or all, or yes, you do need sort of the Goldilocks amount of insulin. And, and now he's taking the kind of internet extremists as, uh, as if that was the scientist view. And, and no, I, I, you need some insulin, but you don't want too much insulin. Um, and I don't think any scientist would say you would want no insulin, although that's the uh, keto influencer, perhaps extreme uh, teaching to get you to worry about it when, when, and then, you know, pot calling the kettle black, he wants you to worry about this, right? That's why he introduces that language. Insulin triggers macronutrient uptake in this order. Priority number one, insulin transports glucose into tissues to either be burned for energy or to be stored as glycogen for later use. Priority number two, insulin transports fatty acids into tissues to be immediately burned for energy or to be stored as triglyceride for later use. Which is fat storage. <laughs> so, okay, finally, at the end of this clip, he's admitting that insulin is the fat storage hormone right there, although he didn't use that language. So if you weren't listening carefully or have the ability to translate fatty acids to fat and going into the cell as storage. Those are all the same things. Uh, pretty interesting. Priority number three, insulin transports amino acids into tissues to be synthesized into new protein, to be burned for energy, or to be converted into other compounds. Understanding this insulin priority hierarchy is very important because it reinforces the concept that insulin's primary role is to handle all things related to glucose metabolism before it begins directing fatty acids and amino acids into tissues. Now, insulin is the most powerful anabolic hormone in your body, meaning that it promotes more growth and more fuel storage than any other hormone. And no, but I thought you said it wasn't. <laughs> It is. Oh boy. Ketogenic dieters exaggerate this fact, condemning insulin entirely, claiming that even small amounts of insulin will make you fat. Fact. Insulin is the most anabolic hormone in your body, responsible for more fuel storage and cell growth than any hormone in your body. Fact. 
insulin promotes more growth than testosterone. So I can't imagine that he's in a clinical setting because if you had cancer, you would look at this and say, oh my goodness, I don't want a lot of insulin around. It promotes cell growth. And what cancer is, is cell growth that's gone amok, that's out of control. So again, we're, we're looking at a, a influencer information coming out that, that isn't really widely applicable and, and could be harmful if, if you're doing well on a keto diet and now, you know, because uh, here's the logic, uh, because uh, insulin's hormonal effect is number two, fat storage, and number one, glucose, and, and then anabolic. So therefore, it's not a fat storing hormone, and therefore, the keto diet people are wrong. It, this, is not, <laughs> this is not good logic. And I, and I wonder what's going on here. Oh, maybe another agenda. Insulin promotes more growth than estrogen. Fact. Insulin promotes more growth than growth hormone. Fact. Insulin promotes more growth than IGF-1. The truth is that all mammals secrete insulin because insulin is absolutely required for life. Your dog secretes insulin. Your pet hamster secretes insulin. Your neighbor's cat secretes insulin. So the, again, it's the amount of insulin that you want to control, not the absence of it. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. I guess if I was coming up with some sort of some argument against something I didn't know much about. Now I'll introduce the idea that the, the hamster you love and your, your neighbor's cat, well, what about my cat, have insulin too. So therefore, don't worry about insulin's anabolic effect or that it promotes fat storage. That's, that's what we're talking about, remember? Insulin. Monkeys secrete insulin. Raccoons secrete insulin. Your non-diabetic coworker secretes insulin. In fact, insulin is so important that if your body stops manufacturing it, you die. Without insulin, your dog would die. Your pet hamster would die. Your neighbor's cat would die. Your non-diabetic coworker would die. In truth, a physiologically normal amount of insulin is absolutely required to stay alive. But secreting or injecting excess insulin is what substantially increases your risk for coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, and cardiovascular disease as a whole. Ketosis. I wonder if someone else writes this and he just reads it because that made no sense when, when you when you look back at it. Of course, insulin is a fat storage hormone, and and you want it to have uh, not too much. And that one is hard for me to to work through. How about you? But let's go on to the next one. Misconception number two: eating carbohydrates spikes your blood glucose. Proponents of the ketogenic diet often argue that eating any food containing carbohydrate energy will spike your blood glucose and that the only way to avoid dangerous blood glucose spikes is to avoid carbohydrate rich foods. Technically speaking, when you eat carbohydrate rich food, your blood glucose will rise. Time out. <laughs> it's as if, so whenever he says technically speaking, he's going to say something true and then explain why it's not true. How can that be true and not true? Eating carbs raises your blood glucose. Now, I have to say, it's not the only way to do it. Protein will do it a little bit, but not anywhere near the carbohydrates. If you want to lower, get a continuous glucose monitor, get a, a finger stick, get a glucose watch, although those don't exist yet. I am here, they're coming soon. You'll know that eating carbs Will, and different carbs have different speed of blood glucose rise. I don't like the term spike. I, I, I agree, I, I don't like that term, but it will raise the blood glucose. And then if it goes up too high, insulin will be sent out because the blood sugar is not supposed to go too high. It's not a health, healthy thing. And so insulin will help the glucose get in the cell. And if there's extra glucose around, you'll turn that glucose into fat in the liver and in the fat cells. And then when the liver is full, it sends out all of the fat to the fat cells. So that's the, the process of carbs, glucose, insulin toward the path of diabetes and obesity. You don't want to go down that path too much. Now, not everyone responds in this way. Some people can mitigate and moderate what they eat. Some people can't. That's why it's more complicated. But let's see how he wiggles around this technically. Carbohydrates raise the blood glucose. Furthermore, reducing your carbohydrate intake will keep your blood glucose more stable. For these reasons, ketogenic dieters maintain 
a total carbohydrate intake less than 30 grams per day, representing less than 10% of total calories on average. What those in ketosis don't understand is that the amount of glucose in your blood is not only determined by the amount of carbohydrate that you eat, but instead a reflection of both your dietary carbohydrate and your dietary fat intake. Now we have written extensively about the detrimental role that excess dietary fat plays in the development of insulin resistance, leading to high blood glucose. Now, time out. I thought we were talking about dietary carb. <laughs> Again, here, here's the, the logic. Yes, dietary carbs raise the, but fat does too. Well, actually fat doesn't. So, but introducing the idea that something else does it as well means that the first thing can't be true. You know, because insulin does all these other things, it can't be the fat storage hormone. When he said it was the fat storage hormone, very interesting um, that, uh, yes, eating carbs raises the blood glucose, and I uh, don't know how you're going to get it out of this one. Because even if fat did, but it doesn't, doesn't mean carbs don't. See the logic there? Increased insulin requirements, high cholesterol, beta cell death, and increased risk for many chronic diseases. It's important to understand that only paying attention to how much carbohydrate you eat will mislead you into thinking that this single macronutrient controls your entire blood glucose profile, when in reality, your blood glucose is determined primarily by how much fat you eat and secondarily by the amount of carbohydrate that you eat. Yeah, no, this is just not true. I, 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 want, I want the data for that. And remember, it's the blood glucose and the insulin you're trying to, to re keep reduced. You can do it in many different ways. The, the order of things is often putting in there as a, as a distractor. So, okay, let's say it is fat is the main thing. And secondarily by the carbs, it still is the carbs, right? So the, it's the logic of, uh, I guess, of, because that true that statement isn't entirely true in every different condition, and then therefore it's not true. Uh, so even if fat is a contributor, which it's not, um, you can eat fat and your blood glucose won't go up. Try it with your glucometer or your, your glucose meter. Uh, but the, it, it, often what happens is studies are done with carbs and fat in the in the same in that same study design and you can often see differences and make claims about things when when you take carbs entirely out of the the food uh, you see different things maybe maybe that's why uh, this well-intentioned doctor isn't understanding what happens uh, when you cut carbs out to understand how your blood glucose responds to different macronutrient profiles let's explore how a ketogenic diet a standard American diet and a low-fat plant-based whole food diet affect your blood glucose. When operating in a high-fat ecosystem on a ketogenic diet, the primary reason why your blood glucose remains flat is because of the near absence of carbohydrate-rich foods. Right. Oh, gosh. Without carbs, you have a flat line. No. A stable blood sugar. Again, that flat line makes me think of the EKG in the emergency room. Not a good thing, right? No, you want a stable blood glucose. In fact, the glucose is made stable by a hormone called glucagon. And glucagon keeps your blood glucose stable even if you don't eat anything. Uh, and it doesn't, glucagon doesn't get much airtime in the discussion of diets because it's difficult to measure. You can't just go to your doctor and ask for a glucagon level, but that's really what's keeping the blood sugar stable or flatlined. In this way, eating a high fat diet is very effective at flatlining your blood glucose because carbohydrates are kept below 30 grams per day. As long as you avoid carbohydrate rich foods, your blood glucose is likely to stay very stable. But the minute you choose to eat carbohydrate rich foods, such as a banana, a potato, a bowl of quinoa, your blood glucose is likely to increase significantly due to a hidden... So why would you want to do that? The clinical context, let me explain. Uh, if, if you came to me and you reversed your type 2 diabetes, you lost 50 to 100 pounds, you're feeling great eating you know, bacon and eggs for breakfast, you, you figure out what foods you like that don't have carbs, you're not going to go back to eating carbs and quinoa. If someone came to me recently and said, my cardiologist asked me to eat more quinoa. What's a quinoa? And, and I had to admit, 
I don't know. It's in a box at the store. I've never had it. So this plays into the um, notion that everyone has to or or should be able to eat carbs and not have blood sugars go up. This is a, it's a selection bias of there are some people who cannot eat carbs without their blood sugar going up. And it changes a bit after you lose weight. The weight causes the insulin resistance and you sure fat in the pancreas and in the muscle, that gets better. Your insulin resistance goes away. But the idea that um, I heard in another video that, well, you're really diabetic until you can eat a donut and not have your blood sugar go up. No, I don't think that's what having controlled diabetes means. Controlled diabetes means you eat healthy in a way that you like and your blood sugar and your insulin doesn't go up. It's the two together. And, and uh, why, you know, if you want to eat whatever you want and take medicine for the, that our medical world today has you do, that's one path. Uh, uh, there's another path, which is to be very careful about what you eat, certainly get rid of all the sugars uh, in the food and the drinks, and then maybe you don't even need those medicines and, and you lose weight. And yeah, that, that's the low carb keto way of going about things. Um, but so back to the, he basically admitted that if, if you don't eat carbs, your blood glucose is flatlined. I mean, stable. Due to a hidden state of fatty acid induced insulin resistance. Now the standard American diet is a perfect example of a diet that is high in both carbohydrate and high in fat, which increases your risk for high blood glucose, insulin resistance, and diabetes. Because both fat and carbohydrate are present in large quantities, controlling your blood glucose becomes increasingly difficult over time. Now, because a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet is low in dietary fat, your carbohydrate tolerance or your ability to eat carbohydrate-rich food increases substantially, resulting in maximum insulin sensitivity and the opportunity to completely reverse insulin resistance altogether. When operating in a low-fat ecosystem on a plant-based diet, it is quite easy to maintain flatline blood glucose as long as your total fat intake is maintained below approximately 30 grams per day and your carbohydrate intake comes from whole foods like fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains and not from products containing refined sugars. So I have to claim plant-based bias here. I thought this was about carbohydrate, not raising the blood glucose or, or carbohydrate does raise the blood glucose. It's just you can eat in many different ways. I, I, I don't see how this is debunking what keto diet influencers say because that's science. Ketosis misconception number three. Diabetes is carbohydrate toxicity and insulin resistance is a state of carbohydrate intolerance. Those in the ketogenic community often label diabetes as a problem of carbohydrate toxicity, suggesting that dietary carbohydrate is the primary cause of the disease process. In addition, ketogenic dieters believe that insulin resistance is caused by insulin itself, triggered by an excess consumption of dietary carbohydrate. I cannot tell you how many people tell me, Cyrus, insulin resistance is not caused by fat. It's caused by insulin. This, my friend, could not be farther from the truth. In order to make these statements factually correct, it's necessary to go back to basic biochemistry principles and understand that the vast majority of people who develop insulin resistance do so by eating a diet containing large amounts of dietary fat, as we discussed earlier. So again, we're getting into the fat in the food or fat on the body inside an organ. And actually, you can develop fat inside the organ by eating carbohydrates. The carbohydrate can be turned into fat in your organ or in your liver and then sent out to the organs. The nomenclature here, is the, the language is difficult. What is insulin resistance? What's carb toxicity? What's carb? And, and he's, jump, he's jumbling it all together, I think, on purpose. In the clinical world, often we use and, and he uses language to persuade you. And I think some people in their minds think of sugar as poison at first. 
be t in, uh, to be the construct to stay away from it at first. Of course, you know it's not poison. You've had it for umpteen years and you haven't died yet. So if anything, it's a toxin or, or a, a buildup over time. But um, the, the idea that insulin resistance is only created by dietary fat is, is a problem. That, no, that, that's not true. <laughs> so that's not true. It, it's the fat in the body, however it got there. Again, it's like the kitty up the tree. I can reverse the fat in the organ by taking the carbs out of the food. To me, it's not so important how it starts. So I have a ladder. I take the kitty out of the tree. It doesn't matter to me if the kitty, no, if there was a branch that climbed over, I would, I would cut it so the kitty doesn't get into the tree again. But the keto low carb diet is like the, the ladder. It's a, it's a method. It's a tool that reverses insulin resistance. Is it because insulin, too much insulin around causes insulin resistance? I think so. Now it's a difficult construct to, to prove, although the, uh, uh, and the, the powers that be influencers in the research world all got together on a paper over the, the and year, 18 months ago, that basically merges the calories in, calories out, and the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis of the hormonal hypothesis of obesity together so that there's an, a, at least an acknowledgement that the idea of raising insulin through carbs takes you down a pathway that you don't want to go. It's one for obesity and diabetes. But so again, I think we're arguing, or uh, he's arguing about um, something that really doesn't matter so much. Uh, and you can accomplish the reversal of insulin resistance by many methods, you know, including a plant-based or animal-based kind of diet. Which one's healthier is going to require, or, or more beneficial, is going to require prospective comparative science to figure that out. Now, the research world has known this for more than 85 years. This was first established in the 1930s by the pioneering work of Drs. Rabinowich and Hemsworth, then further proven by Dr. Kempner in the 1950s and by Dr. Anderson in the 1970s. Oh, Dr. Kempner started the rice diet here in Durham, North Carolina. Hemsworth and then Jim Anderson and I was actually on the residency program at the University of Kentucky when Jim was there um, in the late 80s working with high fiber diets, high fiber. And the Kepner diet, also known as an ultra low fat sort of diet, is no longer available here in Durham. It, it faded out under different forms. And actually these studies that he cites do not prove that you can get the kitty down out of the tree with a ladder. You don't need the, you know, uh, whatever contraption someone else has. So, so just because you can show that high carb diets can reverse insulin resistance and that those people therefore thought it was from the high carb diet doesn't mean there's not another way, uh, another cause. Interesting to see uh, Jim Anderson cited, we, we called him the brand man. He had a book on oat bran. Despite this, the cause of insulin resistance and carbohydrate intolerance remains one of the most debated subjects in the world of diabetes even today. Now think of insulin resistance as a series of metabolic dominoes. The dominoes are arranged in this order. Number one, you eat a diet containing dietary fat greater than about 15% of total calories. Number two, you go and eat a banana, a potato, or a bowl of rice and check your blood glucose two hours later to find that your blood glucose meter reads a high number like 246. You point your finger and say, hey, bad banana, bad potato. I guess these foods are bad for me because clearly when I eat them, they increase my blood glucose. Now, the reason this happened is not because bananas and potatoes and rice are bad foods, but because insulin receptors in your muscle and in your liver have become dysfunctional due to too much dietary fat. That's right. Under normal circumstances, the glucose from these carbohydrate-rich foods are accompanied by insulin. And insulin's job is to say, knock, knock, I have some glucose, would you like to take it up? Normally, cells in your liver and muscle would say, sure, bring it on in. But when you've eaten your way into insulin resistance, insulin receptors say, you got to be kidding me. Do you see how much energy I already have inside? I got to burn this stuff first, and then, and only then, will I allow glucose in. For now, you stay in the blood. 
So when glucose becomes trapped in your blood due to these dysfunctional insulin receptors, you have a choice. Either you avoid carbohydrates like the plague and continue to re remain in ketosis, or you drop your fat intake and gain the ability to eat carbohydrate-rich foods. So if diabetes is not a problem of carbohydrate toxicity, but a problem of fat toxicity, then the correct statement is this. Insulin resistance is a state of carbohydrate intolerance first created by the consumption of excess dietary fat. Ketosis. So there again, the, the link between fat in the cells or fat in the organs and fat in the food. Well, fat in the food can't be absorbed and stored unless you have insulin in the blood and you need carbs and fat. Carbs will raise the insulin and you can absorb the fat in the food because of the car. So there's always that carb fat connection. And that might be the way the kitty got up the tree or the insulin resistance was created. But there's another way to do it, which is to keep the carbs super low, get the insulin down and the body starts healing itself. Let's go on to misconception number four. Misconception number four. Carbohydrate is not an essential nutrient. Now the ketogenic world is quick to point out that there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. In contrast, well, yeah, that I wrote the paper, <laughs> or I, I'm an author on it with Justin Tont, uh, T-O-N-D-T. Uh, I'm going to see how he, he uh, gets out of this one because all the world nutrition experts say this. It's not just me. In contrast to required nutrients like essential fatty acids and essential amino acids. While this statement is technically true, labeling glucose as a non- Oh, there's that term again. Technically true. How can it be technically true and then not true? I don't know. Let's see. Technically true. Non-essential carbohydrate implies that there is no use for glucose in the human body. Oh, oh, not at all. I've never said that. I mean, in the, in the paper that we wrote on the, actually there's some times when it might be conditionally essential, uh, but for most humans, carbohydrate is not essential. You can get all of the vitamins and minerals from all the other foods, even you don't need the carb containing ones. What's very interesting is we never say in that paper that therefore you don't have to eat carbs. Or, or there's no need for carbs, or carbs aren't tasty. I mean, we never, we never say that. I don't think it implies that there's no use for glucose in the body. Our bodies actually make glucose and fructose through processes in, in the body. Gluconeogenesis is the term for glucose creation. And you can make glucose from all of the protein and fat that you eat. So it doesn't imply there's no role for glucose. Uh, but let's see where, where he's going with this one. Once again, we have to return to basic human physiology in order to understand the truth. Now your liver, your muscle, and other peripheral tissues are capable of oxidizing glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids for energy. Your brain, however, cannot oxidize either amino acids or fatty acids for energy. Your brain can only run off of glucose for energy and does not possess the biological machinery to store glucose. As a result, your brain must oxidize glucose on demand. In Hold on. Where are the ketones? This is not true. The brain uses ketones. Oh, remember that keto diet for epilepsy? It switches the brain from using mostly glucose to mostly ketones. It, and it blocks seizures in some of the susceptible children. So this is factually this is probably the most egregious thing it goes back there it's even even worse there was a world organization summary or leaders of the world expert panel saying you know there's 100 the the brain uses 120 grams of glucose a day therefore humans must eat 120 glucose grams a day now carbohydrate grams well wait a minute were, was no one on this panel a, a physiologist or a doctor or, a, or someone who knew that the human body can make its own glucose? Oh, but I guess these reality shows didn't exist then, so they couldn't watch TV and see that people function just fine without eating carbohydrates because they shifted into nutritional ketosis. So I'm sorry. I mean, if there was a way to kind of flag this as this is inaccurate information or, or you know this is only for not for children who are still trying to learn 
Actually, the brain runs on ketones, and that's how you can actually survive without eating for very long, fast, and you shift over to a ketone. He's right that when you're eating lots of carbohydrates, the brain uses glucose and it shifts to ketones. And I've often wondered if it's the other way around. Maybe we ought to be running our brains on ketones and every now and then have some carbs and maybe shift to, to the glucose economy of fuel. But this is kind of sad. You can Google or, or Wikipedia or, uh, and, and debunk this one. Importing glucose from your blood 24 hours a day. Since glucose is your brain's principal on-demand fuel, carbohydrate-rich foods are your brain's primary fuel source. Now, when you consume a low-carbohydrate diet, you force your liver to synthesize an emergency backup fuel known as ketone bodies to prevent against brain starvation. And you enter the state of ketosis in which ketone bodies become your brain's primary fuel. Ke oh, wait. Oh, it does use ketones. Oh, but it didn't before. Oh, only an emergency. No. After two days, everyone starts using ketones. Your brain starts using ketones if you don't eat anything. Uh, so, and then instead of the uh, big neon sign ketones going to the brain, we got this funny little acetone, acetoacetate, beta So very interesting. So I have to think that if you're trying to reason through what we typically see, this all kind of makes sense. Everyone eats carbs. It's weird for people to not eat carbs and, and, and it's not normal. So we, we think, you no, know, it's not common. So we don't think it's normal. And so then actually when you eat carbs, the brain does run on glucose. So therefore you must eat carbs because when you eat carbs, the brain runs. No, there's a different, it's almost like going to another country where they drive on the other side of the road. It works. You just have to drive on the other side of the road. But you know, they make the cars differently. They, the steering wheels on the, the wrong side. The, my goodness. <laughs> a lot of judging too in these videos. It's like, if it's not our way, it's wrong. Or, or if it's not the carbohydrate eaters, normal process, then it's, then it's wrong. When actually I'm beginning to think that the nutritional ketosis is more like a, a backup plan and, and maybe even you make economies in how your body is working. You, you have some autophagy, you start cleaning up things. After thinking about this a long time, uh, actually the, having a lot of glucose and carbs around what might make you sloppy in terms of energy efficiency and, and building things and, and, uh, and have extra energy to do things that maybe you don't want your body to, uh, to have done inside. Um, so anyway, back to the, the idea that the brain must use glucose. No, it can use carbs just fine. Ketogenic diets were originally invented for people with epilepsy and are effective at reducing seizure incidence. However, ample evidence shows that ketogenic diets come with a laundry list of unwanted side effects that simply cannot be overlooked, including, but not limited to, diarrhea, nausea, constipation, vomiting, acid reflux, hair loss, kidney stones, muscle cramps, muscle weakness, hypoglycemia, low platelet count, impaired cognition, inability to concentrate, impaired mood, disordered mineral metabolism, stunted growth in children, increased risk for bone fractures, osteopenia, osteoporosis, increased bruising, acute pancreatitis, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, insulin resistance, elevated cortisol, heart arrhythmia, myocardial infarction or heart attacks, menstrual irregularities, amenorrhea or loss of periods in women, and an increased risk for all-cause mortality or premature death from any cause. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure what this had to do with the, the myth, uh, but that's okay. He goes off on, on these tangents. The ketogenic diet for epilepsy is not what I teach. What I teach is in the, the background of the Banting diet, the Allen Osler diet, the Atkins diet. It's not the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. And the papers that he's referring to about the keto diet for epilepsy, some of these side effects are real, but these children are not, not healthy. They, many of them have seizures 50 or 100 a day. And some of them are, are 
fixed overnight by the keto diet, but most not. Some have improvements, but most are not totally cured by it. But so what happened is that they started doing studies on the children with the ketogenic diet for epilepsy and then slathering that over generalizing that onto the adults who use the protein based keto diet that came out of the obesity and diabetes world when these are very different clinical situations and very different teaching approaches to keep people away from sugar and starch and to get protein as your primary source of energy. Anyway, the detail of how you teach it has to be correct too. But, but the, again, this is not the keto diet for epilepsy that I'm teaching. And yes, the keto diet for epilepsy is, uh, it's a big deal. And some, but some uh, children have great improvements as a result of it. Um, if you want to know more about the keto diet for epilepsy, that's the Charlie Foundation. Charlie had uh, childhood epilepsy. And then Johns Hopkins has a teaching program where they teach doctors all over the world how to use a ketogenic, ketogenic diet for epilepsy. In fact, Eric Kosoff at Johns Hopkins did a study on using an Atkins type diet, which is not as strict as the keto diet for epilepsy, and actually had some effect on adults with epilepsy. So apples and oranges here. And then how we got into all these other premature death. Again, that's the, the nutritional epidemiology, keto-like kind of diets that you don't have to wait 20 years. You can measure your own health every year as you go along with however you live. Yes, that's right. People who eat low carbohydrate diets die sooner and suffer from more disease in the long term. If that's not enough to dissuade you from eating a low carbohydrate diet, I'm not sure what is. Therefore, labeling carbohydrates as non-essential is not only factually inaccurate. No, time out. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Sorry. It results in a wide variety of chronic health conditions that may ultimately shorten your lifespan, decrease your quality of life, and accelerate your risk for chronic disease. Ketosis mis... So... If you were my patient and you, you slather or slog through all of this, what he's saying at the end is, is just not true. The idea of the long-term issues, it might be true. We don't have, so the studies that he cites are, are not done with people with the modern day version of how you restrict carbohydrates and eat a low carb diet. You can't know that future, but you can actually measure your own body and make sure you're not going back into that direction of un unhealthy direction. Misconception number five. This misconception number five. Low fasting insulin means high insulin sensitivity. People in the ketogenic community often measure their fasting insulin levels as an indicator of their insulin sensitivity. A fasting insulin test measures the amount of insulin your pancreas must secrete in order to control your blood glucose. The lower the number, the less work your pancreas is performing. This is a good thing. Ketogenic dieters often report very low fasting insulin levels, then draw the conclusion that their insulin sensitivity has increased. This could not be farther from the truth. Well, so that's my belief, is that for just about everyone, if your insulin level is low, it means it's working really well. And uh, depending on your blood glucose level too, you want that to be normal. And why, I, I think, I, let's see, I think I can predict that it's the old, but when you eat carbs, your insulin is going to go way up because you haven't had carbs. And that's not the definition of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is being able to metabolize carbohydrate easily and, and without a huge rise in insulin and without excessive fat production. So I, I think uh, that will probably be the distraction. The only way to actually measure your insulin sensitivity is to utilize a glucose challenge in which you either drink a solution containing glucose dissolved in water or you eat a food containing carbohydrate energy. In the clinic, your doctor may order a glucose tolerance test to measure your insulin sensitivity. The way that you measure insulin sensitivity using an oral glucose tolerance test is straightforward. Step one, you drink a solution containing 75 to 100 grams of glucose dissolved in water. So time out. <laughs> Why would you ever want to drink a solution containing 75 to 100 grams of glucose dissolved in water? So the, the, the 
test is designed for carb eaters and, and carb burners. The, the, to measure the insulin resistance in someone who doesn't eat carbs, there was a study done some years ago where the, the tolerance test was actually matched to the food distribution in that group. So for example, the, the people were randomized to the high fat, low carb diet or the high carb, low fat diet. And then they did a meal matched test so that the people who were eating the high carb diet got to eat the high carb meal to see the blood glucose and, and insulin rise or afterwards. But the low carbers were given a low carb meal to see what the effect on the glucose and insulin is. That was a matched to the diet they were on. And as you would expect, those who are eating a low carb diet for, for weeks and it was given a low carb meal, their blood glucose didn't go up. In fact, we call, heard it called flatline. So, so if you eat a, a low carb meal, it's going to be fine. If you eat a, a, so if you give someone a high carb meal or 75 to 100 grams of glucose after they haven't had glucose, their insulin is going to be kind of sluggish to get going, to rev up. Uh, and, and that gets misinterpreted as worsened insulin resistance. I see this through multiple videos through the, the anti-keto type of people. No, if your blood glucose and insulin are low, you don't have insulin resistance. You don't want to challenge yourself with carbs. I mean, I mean you can, and, and you can get back into that while well, you beef up your insulin and you might need an insulin of 50 so that you don't get a blood glucose to rise above, you know, 120. That's, that's called, you know, normal if you're a carb eater or what you want is the blood glucose and insulin to stay low and eat foods that are nourishing and tasty. And you can do that without a blood glucose and insulin rise, which would be caused called insulin resistance. If you ate sugar or you ate carbs, it would go up, but no, the, the, test is being used inappropriately here. You wouldn't use a glucose tolerance test to look at the healthiness of someone who's not eating glucose. Does that make sense? Yeah, I hope so. Step two, a medical professional samples your blood at 0, 60, 120, and 180 minutes. Step three, your blood samples are analyzed for glucose and insulin. Step four, your performance is measured against a standard to determine your insulin sensitivity. The higher your glucose and insulin area under the curve, the worse you perform on the test and the higher your level of insulin resistance. So if, if you stop, look at this figure in a short period of time, if you cut carbs out and then you give yourself a challenge, 75 grams of glucose, again, why would you want to do that? The people who have been used to eating carbs, that's the purple, low fat, plant-based whole food diet, don't have such a rise. I'll see if they're measuring the insulin. The insulin probably went up to keep the glucose down. And then the, because your insulin isn't you know, ready to go. Oh, Dr. Atkins used to counsel people to eat carbs for a week or two before getting a glucose tolerance test. So if you want to be tested in the old paradigm way, or if your doctor insists upon it and you're not eating carbs, you want to refeed carbs for a couple of weeks. Again, why would you want to do that? Oh, to get your insulin ready, your pancreas is ready to secrete the insulin to keep the glucose super low. So again, I think it's the wrong test to be doing when you're not eating carbohydrates. The lower your glucose and insulin areas under the curves, the lower your level of insulin resistance. The reason why this test is so valuable for measuring insulin sensitivity is because it measures the ability of your muscle and liver to uptake glucose from your blood when challenged by a food or drink containing glucose. Simply measuring your fasting insulin or fasting blood glucose independent of a glucose challenge is insufficient information to conclude anything about your level of insulin sensitivity. However, many ketogenic dieters and medical professionals fail to understand this concept entirely. If you never challenge your glucose metabolism with carbohydrate rich foods or with a glucose solution, it is simply impossible to measure insulin resistance. Despite this, those in ketosis often claim that their insulin sensitivity has increased, even though they avoid eating carbohydrate rich foods at all costs. Ketosis misconception number six. 
Low carbohydrate diets are not high protein diets. That just makes no sense to me. If you are healthy and you don't mind not eating carbohydrates and your glucose and insulin is normal by any measure, you don't have insulin resistance. Oh, again, there's that fear of, oh, well, no, we need to subject you to the carbohydrate challenge. And, and you know, it, it, it's a different paradigm view, you see. It's a different, it's the wrong test to be doing now. Ketosis misconception number six. This misconception number six. Low carbohydrate diets are not high protein diets. Let's go into detail to understand the caveats of this statement. The first question to ask is this, what proportion of total calories constitutes a high protein diet according to the scientific evidence? Now, according to the evidence, diets containing more than 10 to 15% of total calories and protein increase your risk for cardiovascular and diabetes mortality, especially if the majority of your protein originates from animal foods. To stop there, according to nutritional epidemiology, what's interesting is there's a kind of um, unspoken fear about certain things. Have you noticed, like, uh, you know, God forbid someone wouldn't have fruit or, or even, you know, or have a banana. Uh, one of my patients came in recently and talked to one of the students there. I, I said, you know, do you eat fruit? And she said, no, my, my I have a banana, my blood glucose goes up, and the, much to the surprise of the student in the room. But people will find that out. They, they know that. So, so the idea that, oh, it's a high-protein diet, uh, that is kind of, gosh, that takes me back to the early 2000s when everyone knew high-protein, it's bad. Well, actually, when the studies have been looked at, prospective studies looking at different types of protein levels, the fear about the cardiovascular disease and, and the kidney disease really didn't come true. I think that protein comes first. You, you want to have protein. And the better way to look at the protein is not by percent of calories, but by the number of grams consumed in a day. And so in my clinic and in our research studies, the amount of grams of protein a day really didn't change much if you do it in a proper way and you eat only when you're hungry. But as a percentage of calories, of course, it's going to go up because you've dropped all of the carbohydrate calories. The, that is going to inflate the protein percentage. And, um, and yet the epidemiology studies use percent of protein as their kind of wide-ranging ruler to measure things. Now, many studies have shown that protein intakes in excess of 15% of total calories increases your risk for heart disease for high cholesterol, for atherosclerosis, for diabetes, and various forms of cancer. As a result, any diet containing an excess of 10 to 15% calories from protein is considered a high protein diet. It turns out that it is practically impossible for a ketogenic diet to be low in protein. Why? It's actually quite simple. Because cheese, eggs, meat, butter, poultry, fish, nuts, seeds, vegetable oil, coconuts, and avocados make up the bulk of calories in a ketogenic diet. With the exception of vegetable or coconut oil, which is 100% fat, every food that I just listed is not only high in fat, but also higher in protein. I'm not persuaded. It's again, apples and oranges of the nutritional epidemiology, higher protein percentages, and the metabolism totally changes when you're in nutritional ketosis. That's one of the reasons why I'm so careful about not overgeneralizing the studies when there was no, even if you're on the edge of nutritional ketosis, because you're not burning the carbs, creating all that oxidative stress like you were before. Um, so ketosis misconception number seven. seven. Evidence-based research shows that low carbohydrate diets are effective. Low carbohydrate diet advocates are masters of documenting the efficacy of their philosophy using studies with small population sizes conducted over short time periods often over either weeks or months. Well, these studies- Or years. Actually, the, the, so this is like my bread and butter, having published papers on low carb diets showing safety and efficacy over the last 20 years. Now the studies have been done all over the world. And sure, yes, yeah, out to a year or two in prospective randomized controlled trials. I value these more than the nutritional epidemiology. Let's study, you know, 
50 million, no, 500,000 people over 20 years where we don't really know what they were eating. We, we asked them what they were eating and then we measure a few things here and there. There's so many confounders and where people are living and other healthy user bias. And the more you eat meat, the more likely you are to smoke in many of these studies. Um, so uh, actually it is uh, by the measure that would be required of a drug for FDA approval, the low carb diets have met that bar. The low carb diets would meet the level of evidence for FDA approval of a drug. It's been studied that much. And actually the duration of the studies since the time of this video has increased over time. And I have to just, as a counter balance, uh, even though it, I know it's not fair of me, but I want the vegetarian vegan people to publish papers out to a year or two as well. And then it won't be the pot calling the kettle black. So a lot of evidence for low carb diets in many different people's hands all over the world. And uh, it is effective. So I, I don't know what's going on here. That is just a, the, the myth is not a myth. While these studies are helpful at assessing the short-term benefits of ketosis, they fail to document the long-term effects of a ketogenic diet. A classic example of this is a paper that was published in 2017 documenting the results of 10 weeks of a ketogenic diet in 262 patients following a diet containing less than 30 grams of carbohydrate per day and an average of 175 grams of protein per day. Now, the researchers document how 10 weeks of ketosis resulted in an average A1C decrease of 1%, an average weight loss of 7.2%, and how more than 56% of participants reduced their need for oral medication. These are all great outcomes. The problem is that the study was conducted in a small cohort over a relatively short period of time. Now, in order to determine the truth... Well, sorry, but I mean, you wouldn't have known, but they've continued that study. It's the Verda Health study. McKenzie was the first author and then Sarah Hallberg and then uh, a couple other, Banpuri, Athenarian. It's uh, using a keto diet to reverse type 2 diabetes. It's one of the best, most potent lifestyle studies about diabetes ever done. 70% of the people on insulin came off of insulin. And, and so actually that, that study has been continued over two years. Uh, so, but we'll give you a pass on that 10 weeks wouldn't have been enough Right, but there are other diabetes studies as well, and kind of like the well, low carb isn't any better than low fat for obesity treatment. That actually, low carb it is better than low fat diets for the treatment of type 2 diabetes, but they're not huge studies, but they are prospective clinical trials, most of them randomized trials, so that I value that more than the nutritional epidemiology, even though they're a higher number, you study them less frequently and less thoroughly, those people, they, and you, you take their word for basically what they were eating, which is a big flaw in my mind. Um, but so actually, low-carb diets are safe and effective. To determine the true effectiveness of any diet, you have to do two things. Number one, study your diet in large numbers of people, which is tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And number two, study the outcomes of people following your diet over long periods of time, greater than approximately five years. Studies conducted in tens or hundreds of thousands of people over five plus years indicate that low carbohydrate diets promote the following disastrous outcomes. Number one, increase... So again, uh, he's taking the nutritional epidemiology studies, which are not carefully, well, they're the best they can, but there's so many reasons for confounding and seeing what you want to see. And the associations are so small that, that we really don't know if they're real in terms of, of, in terms of the things that he's talking about. So actually there was a government NIH funded study. I have to think that it, kind of took the wind out of the sails of, of the funding of lifestyle programs because it didn't work. This was called the Woman's Health Initiative, and it used a low-fat diet in 48,000 women over eight years, just like he was asking, and it didn't work. So they, our government put all of their eggs in one basket, the low-fat diet, and it really didn't do much of anything in eight years in 48,000 women. Now, in his defense, that study on vegetarian low-carb 
or vegetarian vegan has not been done either. The government has not thought that that was worthy of studying and um, you need to convince you know, panels of people and study sections and to get people to uh, approve such a study. And uh, I have to say uh, for both the vegetarian, vegan and keto lifestyles, if you do them, or how about any lifestyle you choose, make sure you measure what we think is help, uh, helpful for measurement of health. You can actually get your arteries checked now. You don't have to just look at the blood cholesterol levels and you can get different scans. I'm afraid we're, we're all in the dark a little bit about the long-term consequences of the programs that we're teaching. But what we do is we follow people over time in a clinical setting. So you wanna do this with people that you, you are trusting we can teach you well. We get into groups of people. Uh, there's social media groups that are full of people following a certain level, you'll see, you know, that someone's been doing this 10 years, 20 years. And, and so 20 years ago, we would have said everyone would have died, you know, after six months on a high fat diet and it, it didn't happen. And, and as we keep going longer and longer, the clinical studies that are being done, people being studied in very great detail, it looks even better and better over time, not worse and worse. So hopefully one day there will be a large scale clinical trial of what he's asking for low carb and even for a vegetarian or vegan type of diet, that those don't exist. Risk for cardiovascular disease. Number two, increased risk for hemorrhagic stroke. Number three, increased risk for hypertension. Number four, increased risk for atherosclerosis. Number five, increased risk for diabetes mortality. Number six, increased risk for obesity. Number seven, increased risk for cancer. Number eight, increased risk for all cause mortality, which is premature death from any cause. No matter how you slice it, low carbohydrate diets trick patients and doctors. So uh, that's pretty slick. I can, I can see if I didn't have 20 years of experience in the low carb world and, and hadn't taught thousands of patients and you know had to learn the nutrition on my own write a paper on carbohydrate not being essential <laughs> he says that's not true well yes it is true and you know something as uh, abstract as food i can see how this might be persuasive but remember they're taking studies that really are not studying what we're doing today and it's called overgeneralizing those kinds of concerns onto you. And, and I have to say, it's not because necessarily they want you to be healthier, it's this they want you to follow their approach, which I guess they truly believe is healthier, but they're not always reading the other science. Um, it's almost like though, if you went to a car dealership and, and they were promoting their car, I mean, that's fine. You know, if you're on the Ford dealer lot, you're gonna be sold a Ford. But they wouldn't argue that, you know, the Volvo doesn't work or the Volvo is dangerous or that, you know, they would say, well, it's more expensive and ours is cleaner. I mean, whatever, you know, persuasion, you, it just wouldn't make sense to say that that other car is, you know, doesn't work or is less dangerous or, uh, or more dangerous. But apparently with diet, you can get away with that. So I'm not persuaded. Um, in fact, these seven misleading statements are pretty much not misleading if you look at it through the new paradigm sort of lens. And, and that's what, the way I want to, you know, be diplomatic about it. I don't think that well-meaning, well-intentioned, smart people are, are, well, there were a few things in there that were misleading, <laughs> but I, I think we're all on the same team in terms of trying to improve human health. Some of us uh, just acknowledge that there are many ways to do it and others of us don't. I hope that's helpful. If you like this, like, please subscribe and ring the notification bell. Why not send this to a family, friend, or neighbor um, who might be helped by changing lifestyle? And um, it's pretty amazing what a low-carb keto diet can do in, in the right hands. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. 
and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.